Welcome to the Edge of NFT, the podcast that brings you the top 1% of Web3 today and what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts of the business side and also the human element of how Web3 is changing the way we interact with the things we love. This podcast is for the dreamers, disruptors, and doers who are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. Hi everyone, this is Josh Krieger. I'm here live at Token 2049. This is a very special episode at BitLayer's Investor Night. And this is part of a Dubai Roadshow that's sponsored by BitLayer. And tonight we're speaking with Charlie Hugh, one of the co-founders and a dear friend of mine. What's up, Charlie? What's up, Josh? Good to have you. It's uh it's just good to be here with you, man. And and you know, we've been through so much together Absolutely. uh since we met on that faithful uh afternoon. I think it was a Saturday afternoon in Venice Beach. Yeah. At one of your events and um From the bull, from the bear to the bull, huh? From the bear to the bull. And um, you know, I've seen you evolve in this space over that time. You've seen us evolve and I think uh you are looking for that right something that really got you excited i saw you yes. in that quest yes um for for a while yes. and it was like for those uh that don't know charlie and we'll we'll get to know him together today and it, it, this is just, i don't think you've actually been officially on the show so this is really yeah, special for me yeah. um for those that don't know charlie he is tenacious and he is one of the most curious individuals i've ever met and i felt like you were going to find something special. I didn't know what that thing was. And when you told me what you were doing, it all made sense. So I'm really excited to learn more about BitLayer and what you're building. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just like start by sharing your vision here? Sure. First of all, thank you very much, Josh. I really appreciate all the support and help. Super glad to have you guys with us along the journey. I know, being very helpful. You know, I think our my vision is like all the way from the first principle, right? I've been in the space almost... 10 years now, um, I've done a lot of things, made some, some mistakes. Be, I'm being scammed by some people as well. I built some stuff and made some contribution to the space early for Polkadot and then for Polygon and also investing as an investor, investing in FTLA as a product investor and advisor uh, and a lot of other projects as well. Um, so back to the principle, right? We as an industry for blockchain has been in the space for a while, has been for a while. It's not a, it's, a, it's still a young industry, but we have 15 years already. That's a lot of things happen. So moving forward, if you ask me, what kind of company can survive in, in 10 years later? I have only two answers. One is a very exciting company called Coinbase, which is very regulated, very professional. I, I participated in their, their, their stock offering, their IPO. Oh, nice. Yeah, it must be doing well, right? And then, oh, it's, it, it had its ups and downs, but I think uh -huh. it's on the way up. I never oh. sold. Oh, great. That's good to know. Yeah, I think I mean, if, if it's uh, like centralized as an equity company, they are the one, only one I believe will definitely survive 10 years later. And the other one is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. With all due respect for all the other things with Ethereum, I was an ETH builder. You know, I know a lot of proof of stake chain, like Solana and so on. A lot of new ones like Barry Chain kind of doing interesting stuff, right? But uh, if I, I only can pick one, 100% going to survive 10 years later. That's Bitcoin. So, you know, our slogan in BitLayer is making history with Bitcoin or for Bitcoin, right? Because that's the only thing I feel like it makes so much sense and it makes me feel so inspired that there's no other thing which is more important besides making money along the way. Making money is a byproduct, but creating history for the industry, like there's nothing more important than doing that for Bitcoin ecosystem, right? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of um, conversation around is Bitcoin's dominance decreasing and, um, you know, mm -hmm. does it really provide this store of value? And, and mm -hmm. I think that happens during the bear market. But then ultimately, as the world has gotten more complicated, um, there's one thing that's true, which is that Bitcoin continues to be one of the highest performing assets yeah. of all asset classes in the world, right? Yes, it's been outperforming every, every single asset class in the world in the last 15 years. Although there's some bear market, you know, there's some downturn, it's volatile, it's getting more and more stable now, right? Sometimes even more kind of boring, you know, in the, I think a couple of months ago, it was, Bitcoin didn't really move up and down, but it was being so stable, being like very boring because people get used to that volatility, right? 
Um, yeah, indeed. Um, because of the principle, the first principle, the ultrasound money, you know, 21 million hard cap programmed in the, in the code, right? Every 10 to 15 minutes, there's a new block with the rewards. There's no other additional supply you can get, right? And there's a lot of Bitcoin in history being just perpetually locked in because some of the wallets, right, that people forgot that private keys are locked in to some of vault and stuff. So the circulation, circulation supply of Bitcoin is, is, is capped, right? And then where's the demand in terms of mass adoption, in terms of using Bitcoin to do all kinds of things is getting more and more. Um, things really get changed, I think, what I was just sharing in the, on the stage as well. You know, with the taproot asset upgration, you know, people can actually put things, put data, creating interesting assets on Bitcoin network, right? And using Bitcoin as a gas fee to do inscription, you know, trading. Bitcoin all of a sudden from this a bit boring ultrasound money, you know, store of value now become, you know, this secure, decentralized, uh, programmable, potentially programmable network, right? Whereas native Bitcoin is like the M0 for money market. And now with Bitcoin layer two and many other new interesting infrastructure layer can create interesting stuff on top of it. So that's all great. I mean, mm. uh, uh, the Maxis would say, you know, just leave Bitcoin alone. <laughs> but, but, you know, everyone else in, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, the Sonar Maxi is pretty excited about the potential to, to build here. And yeah. I'd like to better understand what, what are you building yeah. and why is BitLayer, uh, in your mind, a vital part of the future? Yeah, thanks for the question. Before I answer directly on the question, um, I want to I wanna, I wanna also kind of address the whole Maxi's perspective, right? So Bitcoin has been very kind of a holy land, right, for some people. Some people want to protect it. They don't want to see some kind of r random weirdness coming along the way. But uh, it's a free market. Bitcoin has been one of the most decentralized, you know, um, permissionless network, right? So the miners, the users make the decision collectively as a whole, right? So for people, as long as there's a product market fit, right, it makes sense, right? That's kind of a philosophical reason. There's a demand, there's supply, and there's a way, there's a reason certain things exist, right? Obviously, some laser eyes of some people who are on the conservative side don't want anything happening in Bitcoin, except you mine the Bitcoin, put their storage, but code, code wallets, right? You know, in before all of those, though, you know, the, now the upcoming Bitcoin layer two or Bitcoin DeFi, Bitcoin as an asset has been zero interesting asset, no, with no yield bearing at all, right? Um, is this really the ultimate destination? Is that actually supposed to be just like that? It, it's debatable, right? But uh, with all those last year, in the beginning, I don't get it either, right? Why we need the Bitcoin NFTs, right? What does it even mean? What we have Ethereum NFT doing interesting stuff already. Although people argue, you know, it's JPEG with a metadata. Uh, you're buying the metadata, not buying the actual JPEG. Bitcoin on all of those is actually natively inscribed on Bitcoin layer one, right? So you're buying the true things. It's immutable. It's immutable. It's tamper-proof. It's on Bitcoin, which is more valuable than Ethereum. So things like that happen. But that's one thing for me, make, move the needle. People are willing to spend their hard-earned Bitcoin as a gas fee, you know, even higher than the normal way for trading. They're actually paying additional SATs gas fee, doing certain gas work, so doing certain minting period, doing certain, you know, NFT mint, right? Why? Because they like the assets. It, because certain reason of social consensus, because of the culture, because this degenerates, this is going to pump, right? You know, there was some asset that really just increase their volume, a value like 100x, even a thousand x, right? So there's certain people generally a lot of more Bitcoin by participating in that, right? So the whole product market fit was there after a while, and that's, it was even bigger than a lot of people thought, right? So you can argue, we don't need any of that. You can choose not to use it, but the market and the community made a decision collectively, right? And that we can, we can tell from the results there was so many new BRC20 or all the other kind of Bitcoin native assets being minted, being inscribed, being traded, NFT assets being, you know, they succeed, they pass the trading volume there. And many and, other and, and top projects have moved over to exactly. it, like what Yuga's done and what on-chain monkeys have done. Yep. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about that on the show. And now let me kind of answer your question about Bitlayer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of talk about the background. Absolutely. So 
for me to start bit layer was because I saw a lot of asset protocols on layer one already there. Cassie said they want he wants to start Rune, which is more technical elegant protocol since last September in in Singapore. Well, I live in Singapore, by the way. I met Domo and Cassie last year. I learned a lot from them. But my mind should start shifting, okay, the Bitcoin ecosystem really to grow and scale in the long run, we need either off-chain protocol solutions or layer two, right? And then my background building, you know, doing ecosystem building for Poly Polygon, and I saw a lot of, you know, interesting Ethereum layer two, like Arbitron Optimism, and my friend's still working there, you know, full-time. I learned a lot from Ethereum, and I think Bitcoin should, could have a very good, interesting layer two ecosystem, right? So essentially, it's very important. And as we start doing research about you know, what's existing technology, what's available, what can be done, what are the kind of remaining questions, why there's no like 20, 30, even 100 Bitcoin layer two in the past, uh, what happened, right? So we realize, okay, there's two problems. One, you know, there's a bunch of sidechain, right? You just through whatever Bitcoin bridge, asset bridge went from Bitcoin layer one to the sidechain. But the sidechain doesn't necessarily inherit the Bitcoin security. So for people who don't really trust this sidechain, they don't like to bridge, right? They don't like to, to the, when things happen in the sidechain, your asset cannot exodus, right? Take, put, out, put back, back to Bitcoin layer one. So that's, that's a key difference. We want to build a Bitcoin security equipment layer two. Users can chip in and, and you know, pull out the assets seamlessly, just like a roll up. That happened in Ethereum already, but because of Bitcoin, the architect is fundamentally different. There's no tooling completeness. There's no smart contract, right? So you couldn't do that, right? So we saw the white paper BVM, right? With this uh, very interesting idea came by this gentleman from Germany, Robert Linux. He came up with this model with logic gateways using the existing Bitcoin scripting language to build that, right? For verif verification and proof. So for us, it was like, wow, it's interesting. Because there's two things, very, very beautiful design about this white paper like BVM. One, it doesn't require soft fork or hard fork or any BIPs. So for the, for the people who know about the history of Bitcoin, it's just a freaking pain in the ass and takes forever to get a BIP approved because there's a lot of uh, politics going on. The miners don't get it. It takes really many years of mind share to understand what's the pros and cons and they eventually get a, you know, get a pass through, right? Tap proofs, yeah. it took them three and a half years to get the upgradation. For us to have another upgradation or even hard fork or soft fork, it will be detrimental to the network even. Uh, it happened with history on BSC, BSV and BCH, right? Um, so I don't think people want another hard fork, right? So BVM using existing opting, uh, scripting language to allow people to do that, it's very exciting. That's the reason we start that. Um, you know, I quickly reconnect with my, the guy who I know, the best engineer in Asia, who I know since 2021, that's kind of why we start the journey, right? Because, uh, you know, with the best engineers, with aligned technical innovation and a vision, with that we can grow very fast. We've been growing very fast in the last six months from just literally two of us now over 55 people now. We raised our seed round quite quickly and successfully back to back. Like OKX Ventures, who's been a big supporter of yes. the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. A quick word from our sponsors who's ready to navigate the cutting edge of tomorrow's legal landscape. Because at Zuber Lawler, they're not just attorneys, they're visionaries. With expertise in emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, and the metaverse, they're paving the way for you to seize the future. For mergers and acquisitions to IP, their selective team delivers strategic solutions tailored to the ever-changing world of technology. Join us at Zuber Lawler, where the future meets the law at ZuberLawler.com. Back to the episode. Lots of great stuff coming up too. I mean, you have your main nut and, and you launched your first NFT, right? Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, since, since we're talking to the NFT guru here. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's, let's, have... let's get into the NFT side. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's uh, Ordinal's protocol assets, right? It's inscribed on Bitcoin layer one, will be eventually on our layer two. And kind of- Lucky, have... lucky helmet? It's got lucky helmet. Kind of, uh, kind of uh, just a random name, nothing very technical, nothing very academic. We tried to make it long down to the earth for people to understand what is a helmet, what is, why it's lucky, right? Because by holding that asset, you potentially, not 100% guaranteed, potentially can get interesting additional assets with airdrop from our ecosystem, right? You will be part of it as an OG, considered as an OG, by holding that, it's a 5K series, uh, not ridiculously uh, huge supply. And uh, for people who hold that, 
like that wallet, in, you know, interact with many other ecosystem, you know, protocols like our DEXs, our restaking protocol, our perpetual DEXs, you know, they have additional yield, additional priority, additional benefits. So it's additional utility on our ecosystem, right? So we want to do that while always having fun. So why helmet, right, if you ask me? It's because from the product design side, Billy A with BVM, with our, the things we're trying to build technically, we want to be the Bitcoin engine. Bitcoin has been slow. Bitcoin didn't innovate. So we, I, I'm, I personally, as a, as a very big race car fan, we want to be the engine, right, for Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been a slow car. And uh, we choose the, the color, orange color, literally same color, this color code See, from Macau. Earlier you were saying this, is, you, you downplayed this, but there's a lot of thought that's gone into these helmets. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, I want to make it so dumbed down, easy to understand. It's obvious, come on, it's a helmet, right? You can read that, just play, just one second, you can understand it's a helmet. So it's very simple, but there's a lot of thought behind that, right? Yeah. But the history, the whole story behind that is basically one build engine, it's an orange color, I'm a Macarian fan, subjectively, right? You know, some people like it, some people don't like it, some people are a Red Bull fan. Um, well, when you live in Singapore, you got to be into racing, right? Yeah, Formula One every year in Singapore is best you know, night race around the world. I, I've been there seven times. Um, every year has been a great journey after Tokyo 1949, right? You had a good time with a lot of old crypto friends. But uh, McLaren is a very good you know, race car brand. That's the only brand with this color, the orange color. That's why we, we feel like it's interesting. Um, so I feel like everybody could be a driver for the ecosystem for Web3. You need to be drive safely. Security first, right? That's our first principle. You need a what? You need a helmet. I love it. Helmet, right? So, so that's the reason behind that. Cool. Well, that, that's one part of some of the unique ecosystem building you're doing, you know, using a lot of your experience and what you've learned at Polygon yep. and, you know, through all the different investments you've done. But the other part is, of course, you, you need an ecosystem incentive program, right? Every, sure. every good L1, L2 needs an ecosystem incentive program. And you have a fun one you're calling Ready Player One. Yep. So maybe you can break that down for us too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, first of all, we learned from a lot of the other existing successful ecosystem player, right? Some other chains have been very interestingly engineered some kind of incentive program. Some of the playbook has been pretty successful. Uh, you know, quickly, very effectively, uh, and bring a lot of developers and users on board. So we learned that from other ecosystems, including Blast, and now with you know, Solana, a few others. So we want to attract a lot of the, the existing proof of stake ecosystem developers, like Ethereum Layer 2s, even Solana, a few others, by providing them proof of stake, even compatible, I know, um, programmability, together with Solana VN and Moonbeam in the future, right? This incentive program with Ready Player One is for the people to be first mover, right? You always want the, the little kind of kick, right? It's just like, just like we're saying, we are building an engine for Bitcoin, right? We need this first boost, right, to initiate. So it's, this is a kind of initiation for running, launching our ecosystem as a fast car, right? We want to speed up further and further. But in the beginning from, you know, idle to speed up, we need this program as an engine, right? So Ready Player One, we are generously giving up almost 5% in total supply of a governance token to the ecosystem for builders, um, you know, we, as a first batch, I think that's pretty helpful. We are on, on, in talks with a lot of interesting builders who really want to stay with us long-term, not just be the bounty hunters. So people come to us, they're not gonna buy default and get the token, right? We have our ecosystem leaderboards with very fair, transparent, but very clear rule set. They need to provide a value. We need to know what they're doing. There definitely needs to be a real builders, not like some potential rug puller, right? All, all kinds of things. And also the when they provide real on-chain you know, transactions, liquidity and a few other things, we're able to support them based on the you know on-chain data and so on and so forth. So it's performance and data driven. And we are willing generously provide value and rewards to the good projects, right? I think that's the feedback we want to create. That's what Arbitron did very well with GMX and Gains. That's Polygon did quite well with QuickSwap. Solana did quite well with a lot of the top project, you know, with Solana DXs. We saw that with, with Blast as well. And they generated a lot of hype from the community. Uh, we try to be careful, uh, be careful, right? Dog, not giving too much random token to some bounty hunters, which, you know, just created essentially sale pressure, uh, which is not good. So, yeah, that's pretty much it about Ready Player and Program. 
exciting stuff and we'll get more into the roadmap on on this journey because we're going to uh hong kong next which i'm really excited about i've never been to hong kong nor is richard okay um he's not on this show because he lost his voice but i know he'll get it back before we we get over to hong kong um but but in the meantime you know let's just talk about this region um briefly uh every time i've been in dubai uh you've been here too Yes. And and uh, I know you have family in Singapore and it's a big deal for you to make all these trips to this region. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the UAE is so important? Absolutely. Um, first of all, UAE is the center of the world, time wise, geographically wise and so on. Uh, Dubai as a city has been very innovating about the policy. They have the Vera, a few other kind of reg reg registration uh, jurisdiction that are very pro crypto, you know, crypto friendly. A lot of companies register here with a license, like that's all public information. Um, I'm learning from all the kind of events, all kind of people and expertise, experts, right, that sh share it with us. That, you know, by the way, we are very excited to partner with Dubai Blockchain Center. Dr. Mawang is the man, right? He, th he has been helping us quite a lot uh, throughout all the Dubai trips. I think Dubai has very interesting edge, interesting advantage, being the center of the world, being very open-minded and sitting on, you know, on the giant show of Abu Dhabi and a few other interesting capital city in the, in, you know, in the Middle East region. And uh, there's a lot of good talents just basically pulling into the city, right? It's very global, has people from all over the world. Uh, definitely, they took some benefits because of the uh, unfortunate geographic reasons, right? With some war, you know, proxy war and so on. A lot of good talents didn't live in Dubai, now just gather together. It's so easy to meet a lot of people from all over the world. Token 24 and Dubai this week has been very, very effective, meeting a lot of top KOLs, builders, investors. Um, for us, it's very important. We don't want to be only Asia-driven. Last year in BRC20, 60% of trading volume of, of BRC20 are essentially just Asia, East Asia, right? China, South Asia, and so on. I'm Chinese, living in Singapore for four years already. I know South Asia, especially Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia quite well. We have our colleagues over there, Thailand as well. UAE has been a very important market, right? As a region, it's not just, you know, as a, as a country. And as a region, it's the center of the Middle East region across and it covers kind of Qatar, Saudi. We're going to, I'm very looking forward to your event a couple of days later in Riyadh. So I think UAE is very strategic for all of, all of the Web3 projects, right? For any project wants to go global, wants to be decentralized community, tapping to different region. It's just simply very silly and even stupid to say, we don't need a UAE, right? It's a such very strategic uh, place for us. And uh, you talk about Hong Kong, right? Um, I will get you around. I, I know Hong Kong very well. Can't wait. Yes, Hong Kong, by the way, have a lot of exciting news, recent news. They just approved the ET Bitcoin ETF and the Ethereum ETF officially. So the Hong Kong government is being, I don't know it's competition or French, uh, like collaboration. UAE government and Hong Kong government has been very helping each other uh, with aligned agenda of pushing Web3 pushing crypto in the adoption. So this yeah. uh, road trip of ours and, and this series is really um, synergistic in, in that sense. So we chose these two places to do some initial content together. And we'll we'll dive deeper into the roadmap and, and how folks can get involved on, on the next episode of um, this series. But in the meantime, where do people go to learn more about BitLayer and dive down the rabbit hole? Yeah, I think the best way is to follow us on Twitter. We try to share as much information as possible on Twitter. There's a lot of information actually every day we're tweeting. Um, there's a lot of events going on. Uh, there's a lot of AMAs. And of course, more importantly, there's a lot of uh, you know, important announcements in terms of Ready Player One, in terms of ecosystem partnership, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the concrete, long, well-thoughted technical articles and information we're sharing. We're talking about DLC, discrete lock contract technology. We're talking about BitVM which we're working on as one of the first Asia team, probably top three in the world, working on that, uh, not just saying and then waiting, but actually working on that. So that's kind of the best way to stay on top of what, what's going on. Telegram and Discord is another channel. And you're also on Twitter, or X. I'll never get that right, but... We, we I keep saying Twitter. Yeah, it's X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We're, what's your X handle? Uh, the... It's called a Charlie Who Sats. I try to be as much uh, you know, active as possible as well. On average, I'm on Twitter space once a day, sometimes even three times a day. We're getting invited by a lot of media partners, ecosystem partners. And we sometimes even just improvise. We feel like we have something to chat about. 
You just get on Twitter, uh, X, you know, X uh, space. Yeah, and you've had some really interesting longer uh, threads on, on where the ecosystem is at and your, your thoughts over, over the last year or two that I right. really enjoyed. And now for a quick word from our sponsor before we dive into the next segment. Are you ready to take your sports predictions to the next level? Look no further than maincard.io, the fantasy management platform that's taking the blockchain world by storm. With maincard, every card is a ticket to excitement. You can predict sport outcomes, trade cards in the marketplace, and challenge opponents in thrilling weekly duels. And don't wait. Head to maincard.io now and start earning rewards with your NFTs because it pays to be early. And now back to today's episode. So um, this has been great. Um, on the on the eve of the happening, this has been a really special yes. uh, conversation for me, and I'm just so excited about Bitlayer and what's to come. We're very selective with our partners and our sponsors, and mm. and for me, this was a no brainer to to work together and make sure the world knows more about what you're up to. So with that, uh, we've reached the outer limit at the edge of NFT for today. Thanks for exploring with us on this starship, and invite some friends and cool strangers on this adventure and make this journey also much better. How, if you're listening, go to Spotify or iTunes right now, rate us and say something awesome. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, join over 125,000 others following by hitting the subscribe button, pass this episode on to a friend or two. Be sure to tune in next time for more great Web3 content. Thanks again for sharing this time with us today. Thank you very much. The views and opinions expressed on Edge of NFT reflect solely those views and opinions of the show hosts and its guests. Please make sure to do your own research. Our show is not financial advice. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk. Whenever making financial decisions, we recommend doing your own research and talking to your accountant for financial advice. From time to time, we may feature sponsored content on the show for which we receive value, and we may share links for which we receive a commission if you make a purchase through one of those links. Refer to our website, www.edgeofnft.com, for our full disclaimer, terms and conditions, and privacy policy.